it's very easy to start a religion. As a matter of fact, it's been done quite a few times. If you look at the Mormons, they started a new religion. If you look at Dianetics, they started a new religion. Scientology. If you look around, it's not that hard to come up with some kind of appeal or mass appeal to where people will jump on your bandwagon and want to go along for the ride. Matter of fact, most people will follow health gurus, wealth gurus, just about any kind of new idea or concept that comes along because people have a need to believe. They want to believe in something. But usually that need also wants to manifest itself in not faith, but in doing. You see, the need to believe in something also has a need to do something about it. And because faith doesn't quite answer that need, people tend to make religion into a works or a accomplishment of the law. That they need to do something about their faith. And so they want to add things that they feel like they need to do so that they feel like they're a part of something that they're accomplishing and fulfilling that need inside. Well, that need inside can only be satisfied by a person, not a doing or an action. It can only be accomplished by God doing something about it because only God can fill the need that's in people in general. Now that need to believe isn't just a need to believe in God, it's a need to believe in something. Because, you see, you can feel satisfied completely in, oh, I don't know, believing in America. Oh, I swear to allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. That fulfills a need that people have to believe in something. They want to believe in the American dream. They want to believe in the Constitution. They want to believe in patriotism. Red, white, and blue, no matter what you do. Or believe in supporting Israel, right or wrong, we're there all the time. Can't go wrong. So that need to believe in something is always trying to fill up, really, some place that only God himself can occupy. Because God created humanity with an emptiness that would only be filled by the fulfillment of the scripture that says bluntly, Emmanuel, in God we dwell, he dwells. Or, in man you dwell. <laughs> should have said that the other way. Emmanuel, in man you dwell. In other words, God with us, meaning God in us. And the Jew was thoroughly confused by that because they didn't quite understand how God could be in you, but they understood that God could be with you. So they always tried to identify it as being kind of like carrying the ark. You know, the ark was in the midst of the people wasn't in the midst of the person, was in the midst of the people. So kind of got a distancing gap there that, you know, they couldn't quite cross over this concept that the prophets had talked about that had been stated that there would come a day when God would inhabit his people. He would be inside, possessed, so to speak. And we know, being born again in the Spirit of God, that God does come in and dwells in us. And when God dwells in you, then you focus in on Him and not on doing or wanting to create and fulfill that need inside. You see, that's what Tozer's trying to bring out when he talks today in our teaching about what we should be focused in on. Because in our Tozer teaching, you know, we want to not waste time. You know, there's lots of things out there that you could do. I mean, you could go out and you could start arguing and debating theology with the best of them. You could become a theologian no time at all. You could sit down and go on the internet and Google some school, you know, and study all the different ways that you can do argumentation and critical thinking. You could go through the dissertations of faith, you know, all 3,000 of them from all the different denominations that there are. Or you could go through Talmudic reasoning and logic and, you know, go into exegetical studies and begin to accumulate all this wisdom and knowledge that you think that you require to have in order to go out and to share the fact of the reality of what God wants you to do. But God doesn't want you to argue. God doesn't want you to con someone. God doesn't want you to talk someone. God doesn't want you to make someone do something they don't want to do. That's stupid. 
Because once they're done wanting to do it, or once they're done doing it with you, and they don't want to do it, they're going to leave it. It's that simple. You don't trick someone into the kingdom of God. You don't s subtly you know, do something that God hasn't already worked on a person in order to bring them to the Word of God. We focus in on Jesus. We don't talk about theology. We don't talk about, oh, you know, you're going to have an abundant life and all this. No, we focus on Jesus. You talk about Jesus. You share Jesus. That's what it's all about. Because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, then I would draw all men unto myself. But if you're lifting up any other purpose or any design other than Jesus, the person himself, and the person of Jesus living inside of a person, then you're missing the boat. You're literally offering up another religion. You're presenting a philosophical point of view that allows for a person to go religiously into life without ever having the power thereof to fulfill that life. They cannot exist in a religious vacuum and accomplish that with which God wants them to do, which is to have this emptiness inside filled by God Almighty Himself. So except that God come into the life and intervene, they have no life. That's why we point to and direct all of our focus and attention on Jesus, not on redemption, salvation, and all this other stuff. We we point to the person who saved us, whom we know, whom we exist and live and have our being with, whom we talk to every day. Believing. Directing the heart's attention to Jesus. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. John 1.36 The Hebrew epistle instructs us to run life's race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For faith is not a once-done act, but a continuous gaze at the heart, at Jesus, at the very triune God himself. Believing actually is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold, consider, understand, and relate to the Lamb of God, and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. We are to have him in our forefront of our eyes, even as he is called the Word of God. Because you see, that was what was interesting, is that people, especially in Jewish culture, wanted to get so wrapped up in just the Word that they thought that the Word meant the written Word, so they would write it down and put it on a parchment, treat it as though it were super holy and that somehow it has special powers, stamp it on their forehead, meaning that stick it in a box, you know, wrap it up and stick it and tie it to their forehead because by osmosis somehow it would come into their mind and that put it on their hands so that everywhere that they pointed to they would always be reminded that they're pointing towards the Word or the Torah, you know, so that it was worshipped more than God Himself. And it's true. The Torah is worshipped more than God. And you can see that even when you get legalistic Christians that are somehow caught up into this whole idea of Seventh-day Adventism or you know sh doing Shabbat or doing the Sabbath, a lot of them get caught up in Torah and they don't talk about the Word of God, meaning Jesus himself. Because you see, from cover to cover, whether it be Torah or whether it be Rit HaDashah or whatever you want to call it, you know, in the Jewish culture and Messianic terminologies, comfort to cover, it's Jesus, period. It's the person who is the Word of God, not the Word of God written and then put down in the dead as though it were coming alive just because the Spirit of God makes it alive, because the Word of God points to and reveals the person of Jesus. All of it, from cover to cover. That's what it is. This literal book, the Bible itself, is Jesus. And in heaven, how that exists? But the person of Jesus is a real person. But he's also the Word of God. When God spoke, there's Jesus. That's it. Does it make much sense to you? That's okay. Interdimensionality of the realities of things that exist within the extant heavenlies, we don't completely fathom. But we understand that we point to always the same way that the Holy Spirit did. You see, there's always been this declination of authority that comes down. God created the world. Then, because of that, you know, the Son of God, being that He is the revelation of God, He was revealed to be the Son of God to us, and He always pointed to the Father. Then, as there is the Spirit of God that caused God the Son to be made manifest in the world by way of preparing for him a vessel with which he would possess, which would be the physical body that Jesus inhabited and had become, that 
the Spirit of God would always point to Jesus. So the Spirit of God doesn't point at himself. Jesus doesn't point at himself. And as you see each one, the Spirit of God points to Jesus. Jesus points to the Father. The Father said, look at my Son, and him I'm well pleased. And if you want to know me, you've seen Jesus. And that's the way that we appropriate all of this. Is that It's a way of explanation of why we focus in on Jesus. Because from the Father and from the Spirit, it's all pointing to Jesus. Even as the Word of God from cover to cover is the revelation of Jesus. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief excursion away from Jesus himself, the attention will return back again and rest upon him like a wandering bird coming back to its window. If you're not talking about Jesus, if you're not relating to Jesus, if you're not explaining what he did, then you're off on a religious trip. You're going on tangents. You're exemplifying and personifying religion in its worst or best case scenario, depending upon what type of vessel that you are. Religion should lead you to Jesus, and as Jesus reveals himself to you, then your religious expression should be all about him and not about what to do. Not about pointing out this, that, or the other thing, or living some life that you think is going to be holy because somehow it's going to do something. No, it's about relating to Jesus every day and having a personal relationship with him and talking to him and having him to lead you and guide you in the way that he said that he would in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean on thy own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. That's all we need to do. That's all we are required to do. Point to Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. There is nothing else but Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> so, in Tozer, I appreciate that. Because, you know, there are people that can get off on every other tangent in the world, and they will as soon as you start talking to them about Jesus. They can relate to you on every theological argument that there is, but they cannot relate to you about a personal relationship with Jesus. Stick with it. Stay there, be there, and live it. And guess what? Jesus will reveal himself to that person. They'll get saved. That's simple. I would emphasize this one committal, this one great volitional act which establishes the heart's attention to gaze forever upon Jesus. We must keep the focus on who we focus on. Otherwise, we lose focus. Simple. God takes this intention for our choice and makes what allowances he must for the thousands of distractions which beset us in the evil world. We go off on different tangents, but he wants us to be personifying and lifting up and listening to Jesus himself, period. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. But everybody can argue about Paul, Peter, theology, Acts, history, Old Testament, New Testament. But can they argue about what Jesus said? No, because it was blood. When we lift our inward eyes to gaze upon God, we are sure to meet friendly eyes gazing back at us. For it is written that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. The sweet language of experience is, Thou, God, seest me. When the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, heaven has begun right here on earth. Because as God looks at you, he sees his Son. And as the Son looks through you to the Father, he sees the object of his love. What is the object of your faith? What is the object that we are meant to be when it comes to teaching, personifying, and living our lives out every day in our normal existence? Is it just a practical reality of saying, hey, you should go to church, you should pray, you should do this, and these things, and they'll be accomplished by way of training ourselves and doing this? Or should we be sharing Jesus? Should we say, hey, you know what? When Jesus walked and talked, what did he say? Shouldn't we be relating more about what he is and who he is and how it's related than talking about the religious Christianity that we can all of us argue about and debate? Because you see, the people that know Jesus don't argue. But the people that argue are always arguing about religious topics. But they aren't arguing about Jesus. They can't. Because Jesus doesn't argue with Jesus. And if Jesus is in you and Jesus is in me, then guess what? He won't argue with himself. Willing. Really.